I wanted to make a CDH tournament out of your wildest CDH decks. So that's what I did. How's it going folks? I'm Matthew, this is The Morris Cards, and today we're doing something very different and very awesome. I'm super excited for this one. I had an idea to make my own top 16 out of viewer submitted decks. So I posted on Twitter with very simple rules. Post your, one of your CDH decks below. I'll pick 16 to feature in a breakdown video. No real criteria. I'll go over a couple of the things I thought about though. I'm mainly with the criteria of wanting to highlight things that I haven't really showcased before. So commanders or strategies. I also picked some decks that I thought had a lot of really smart competitive focused deck building we're gonna break them down but to be able to really showcase them we're gonna do this across two videos so that i can do eight decks this video eight decks next video really give them all you know enough time to show what what's going on and also i have split them into pods of four so we are doing an actual top 16 and you guys down below are gonna let me know what deck you think won the pod i want you to tell me your favorite deck down below in the comments pod number one pick your deck pod number two pick your deck and then in the next video we're gonna do the same thing and then we're gonna have a top four where we have you guys vote and then we'll declare a winner. I got well over 100 submissions on this, so it was literally more competitive than some of my actual tournaments I've covered. And if this is something you guys really like, if it's something you wanna see more of, different takes on, I wouldn't even mind doing something like this once a month. I think it could be a lot of fun, a great way to shake things up. With all that being said, let's hop into it and look at our first deck in pod number one. Use the link in the description below to download Whatnot and you'll get $15 to use to buy Magic Singles, Sealed Product, get anything that you want really. There's no limits. You just get $15 on the account for free just for signing up. This is one of the best ways you can support the channel. And again, it's just free stuff. Use the link in the description below. Give Whatnot a try. So to give you something of a meta breakdown in this nonsense sort of meta game, two things that really stood out that were really popular, blue, green, hermit, druid, food chain style decks, and then the alternative partner commander options. So there were a lot of commanders with backgrounds. There were a lot of friends forever, doctor and companion, like that kind of stuff. Those are really popular. I'm not really sure why that is, but those seem to be really popular with people. So the first one of the decks we're gonna look at is one of those. So we're looking at Burakos, party leader with the background of Sword Coast Sailor. So this is a Demir deck. Bird Coast is, you might be familiar with, four mana. It is an orc. It's also a cleric, rogue, warrior, and wizard for the purposes of the party. Whenever Bird Coast attacks, defending player loses X life and you create X treasure tokens where X is the number of creatures in your party. So Bird Coast generates this mana, pressures life totals, all that good stuff. And then with our background, it works really nicely. Commander creatures you own have, whenever this creature attacks a player, if no opponent has more life than that player, this creature can't be blocked this turn. So you can always have a free attack in with Bird Coast if Sword Coast Sailor's out. We are gonna have a good selection of creatures across the party types. So we've got wizards like Siren Storm Tamer, Dark Confidant. We have some powerful rogues like Dothy Voidwalker, Fairy Mastermind, clones that are just good like Flesh Duplicate. Gilded Drake, which can, I guess, get us a party member. Sig River Cutthroat, which is a nice rogue. Opposition Agent, Grim Hireling. These are just you know, Notion Thief. These are just powerful creatures that people play anyways that happen to be rogues. I think the only warrior we have is Mind Blade Render, which is uh, an old staple of Najila decks you don't really see anymore that uh, lets you, basically lets you draw a card when you uh, hit somebody with a warrior. Nice, and it fills our party up. Uh, we even have Thassa's Oracle, the best wizard in the format. So we've got a decent amount of just generically good creatures that also happen to work with our party type. And then we have some other synergy creatures in the deck as well. And then we have some other generically good creatures like Shieldred and Talion, you know, drawing cards, pressuring life totals, lines up with what this deck's trying to do. And then we have some other cards that are synergistic with our list, like Academy Manufacturer. So this, whenever you would make a treasure, whenever you make a clue, photo, clue, food, or treasure, instead you make each of those. Bur Coast, if we attack, we would make two treasures. Instead, we make two treasures, two clues, two foods. And I'm gonna give you a little spoiler alert. The reason that we care about that is because we are a time sieve deck, which I think is really cool. We can kind of do the Tivit thing. It does require a little bit more than like Tivit does just smacking because even with a full party, we only have four creatures in our party. So we need one other way to generate one extra piece of material. So cards like Academy Manufacturer, like I said, like that, 
that works out. That makes it actually very, very easy to do it. We also have Braids Arisen Nightmare. This is a card that I just talk about a lot because I think it's good and cool. We're going to generate lots of treasures. We're going to have lots of material lying around. We can sacrifice them with Braids, draw three cards potentially. Mastermind Plum. This is a card that's been suggested for like a lot of treasure decks. This is the type of treasure deck I want to see it in because our commander actually makes treasures. I think this is not a good card in a deck like Corvold just because we use treasures. Corvold doesn't really make material and Corvold eats up a lot of stuff. So I think this is actually where you want to see it is in a deck that creates the material that you can use with Mastermind Plum to get cards. We have some staples, again, like I do in a lot of my deck techs. I'm not going to highlight the cards that you guys are used to seeing. Coveted Prize. So four and a black costs one less for each creature in your party. Search your library for a card, put it in your hand, then shuffle. If you have a full party, you may cast the spell with converted mana cost four or less from your hand without paying its mana cost. Here, you know, if you can get that reduced to like three, we have lots of ways to help make more party members. You can get this reduced to like if you have a full party, it's it's like a one mana better Beseech the Mirror. That's very good. That's very strong. Transmute Artifact. Again, we're a time sieve deck. We'll see if there's other artifacts that we care about. Concerted Defense, this was a card we would see in like some Najila decks again back in the day. So kind of pulling from that in a couple ways. Again, notably no Ad Nauseum in this deck list. We do see the Born. I'm not sure if there's a Necro. We'll, we'll get there. Artifacts. So we've got a lot. So we have typical kind of good stuff. We have Graph Digger's Cage because we don't really care about using our graveyard. Um, we have Cursed Totem. We do have, what was it? Dothy as an activated ability, Fairy Mastermind, Grim Hireling. So we're shutting down a couple of our own things. Malevolent Hermit as well. And Siren Storm Tamer. So we actually do have an okay amount. Like our deck isn't built around activating abilities of creatures. There's enough overlap here to where Curse Totem is going to shut down some of our stuff and it will be awkward at times. It is going to do way more work though against like the green deck. Time Sieve again, one of our main things. So we have Winter Orb. This is a card we're just seeing more and more of lately. People are kind of catching on to this. We're really good. If we can just sit down our commander playing like a creature a turn off the treasures, we're getting more treasures. We're dealing more damage each turn. It's going to line up pretty well for us if people aren't really able to cast spells. Robe of the Arch Magi, when equipped creature deals combat damage to a player, you draw that many cards and you can equip it to our commander for only one because it is a wizard. It's a 2-4, right? Base power toughness. So one mana, it's going to draw to our commander is already evasive because of the Sword Coast Sailor. So we're going to, on attack, make one, two, four treasures, deal one to four damage, hit them for two, draw two cards, and it's unblockable. Pretty good. Again, if you have like that down with like Winter Orb, you're going to be breaking parity on those effects big time. So we do have the Blood Chief Ascension, though there wasn't a Mind Crank. So we're just running the Blood Chief Ascension. This card just puts the pressure on life totals. That's kind of what we're doing. We are in the Necropotence. Don't have to use it in a turbo fashion if you don't want to. Can do it if, you know, you got the Born Upon One and a bunch of mana. And then Black Market Connections. I think it's a great card here. You know kind of the main stuff it does. You can use it, make a treasure, draw a card, and then you get to make a Shapeshifter with Changeling. This card was made with the, in the same pre-con as this commander. It made to make things that fill out your party very quickly. And then our mana base from the Cavern of Souls makes a lot of sense. We can name a whole lot of creature types, and then it overlaps with our commander. That's an awesome synergy. I think this is a really cool cool list has a lot of thought put behind what it's trying to do and the board states it's trying to make. I don't know how much tournament reps they have with the list, but it looks awesome. It looks really smart. It's approaching Demir in a different way. It's not just like hard control and it's also not ISO rev stuff. I think this is an awesome list. Next up, we've got Drummer Boy Noah's plus J Hat Field, but I think Drummer Boy Noah was the one who uh, suggested this list. Robot Stompy. Slicer is one of the most requested commanders for me to talk about. I don't think it's shown up in any of our top 16s that we've done. We've talked about it a little bit on the podcast, but this is another reason I wanted to talk about this deck because one, I think this build of it looks good. It looks focused. It's not all in on just kill him with Slicer. That's all we can do. There's like a smart combination of stacks effects and things like that. Like it looks like a competent list. And then also I wanted to talk about Slicer because I haven't got to on the channel and people have really really wanted to he hear about it. Let's take a look at the list. We've got Jessica. It's a card I've seen like once or twice out of the zone in other decks because we're trying to get out Slicer very quickly. If you're not familiar with this commander, you can pay three mana to get it out by paying the more than meets the eye cost. God, this game's ridiculous. Three mana, it comes out. It's a 3-2 first strike haste when it deals combat damage to a player, convert it, and then it kind of just stays converted forever. And basically it's a double striker haste that each comp, each turn, you're going to give it to your opponents and it's goaded. They can't sacrifice it. They're going to smack somebody for six at the very minimum. It's going to be a lot more than that once we put a lot of uh, equipment on it. One of the strong things about this is Jessica, the zero isn't this turn. It's until your next turn. If the creature would deal combat damage to one of your opponents, it deals triple. Have Slicer, you Jessica zero it. Slicer is going to be dealing three damage tripled 
Double strike every time it hits. 18 damage, commander damage. Dealing 18 commander damage to each of your opponents. Uh, creature package is pretty slim. Goblin Engineer, we have a whole lot of artifact synergies in this list we want to take advantage of. Phyrexian Revoker can let us hate on problematic permanents. Flow Bad is just a way to keep our slicer safe. Solus Jailer, we don't care about any of these effects. Magus of the Green locks people down. Fury can clear up blockers, get rid of problematic creatures. Blasphemous Act to deal with the board if it's just too much for us. But Cannon Deck goes crazy. Slicer is going to get kind of locked down and not be able to do a lot. And we have other wipes. So like Anger of the Gods deals three. Our Slicer is a three, four most of the time. So it'll survive those kind of wipes. Same with Brotherhood's in. Magnetic Theft, that's going to let us attach an equipment. Then a whole bunch of free or cheap spells that work well in Mono Red. So there's like, there's a lot of good interaction here. I like digging into cards that, yeah, they don't look great other than decks wouldn't play them but we're not other decks we're mono red we're slicer we got to protect our dude we got other things to do that stuff that locks people down like chalice welding jar to keep our slicer safe cage don't care about that kind of stuff and then a bunch of equipment that works well give our slicer flying for just one mana commander's plate it's going to get plus three plus three and have pro everything but red expedition mat what land do we want to find we can get mishra's workshop saga tabernacle we'll get to the mana base but yeah there's a map in there so we have a whole bunch of things that affect other people we'll say that no rod does affect us we have activated abilities of artifacts this is going to require player discretion don't just slam down the null rod a whole bunch of equipment jitte sort of feast and famine sort of fire and ice the reaver cleaver that'll mess some people up that you're gonna make like 70 billion treasures if <laughs> when this hits somebody hammer of nazan to speed this up every time we play an equipment just slam that boy right on the slicer stacks the effects like static orb um and tangle wire so you might look at a card like tangle wire and think like oh but they're just going to tap down our slicer but the way that this works you're going to control slicer on the beginning of their upkeep and then both of those triggers are on the stack and they're both your triggers so you get to stack them to where i'm going to have you tangle wire tap down your stuff and then i'm going to have you gain control of slicer they don't have to worry about that enchantments we're keeping it simple aggravated assault blood moon get to war cry and you can use it to pump it get people dead really quick and then the mana base so there's a lot of cool things here command beacon help us get access to slicer cheap homer path get slicer if we need it so tabernacle will never see your slicer triggers will go on the stack first and then your slicer trigger will go on the stack above that and resolve they'll get control of it and then they have to pay for tabernacle yeah this is cool this is just a cool slicer list looks really clean looks like a smart approach to the deck i'd love to see it in action it looks like a lot of fun next up we are looking at mab the queen's kess queer culture this is a kess list that it might look weird you know to some people what it's focusing on but there's actually a lot of historical precedent for this deck when i was looking at older decks for a video i did recently this was like kind of a, a little bit of an archetype for kess reanimate or just like creature combo kess that uses its ability to cast the same spells multiple times or keep firing off when attempts uh, once it has a lot of resources and that's kind of what we're doing here drc helps us get stuff in the yard lots of staple cards the ones that stand out kiki jiki a card that combos with a million different things here we have the pester mite and the deceiver exarch both of these combo with kiki you get to get infinite dudes they untap blah, blah, blah. they get haste you win the game very simple hard to interact with because creature combos are typically hard to interact with we have displacer kitten which can even like make it easier to refire these things a lot of the time they're gonna have to try to use removal to interrupt your kiki jiki combo and if you just flicker kiki jiki it has haste so like they go to remove it you do anything in response flicker kiki jiki try to do it again on top of them it's gonna make it a lot harder and then also displacer kitten is just a good card abola spawns a card that doesn't show up that often but i've covered a couple times usually it's just you're copying an etb lines up really well with bowmaster just on etb your bowmaster dies okay cool yeah and then other cards you're familiar with other than phyrexian delver so when this comes into play return to our creature card from a graveyard to play you lose life you would like cards for your mana cost again this is another creature it's hard to interact with you can put this into play reanimate a thing lines up well with displacer kitten lines up well with kiki jiki a whole lot of different synergies there i got to see this get flipped off of a counterbalance and counter ad nauseum that's one of the funniest things I've ever seen. Staples, again, in the sorceries, but we do have the kind of reanimator package of reanimate, exhume. Exhume is really interesting in this format, maybe almost going too deep. Sometimes it's going to line up well for you. Sometimes it can even be like sort of a political thing. It's just a card you have to watch out for in a four player format when you're reanimating something for everyone. Umar Grave and Buried Alive are both going to help us set up reanimation packages, but they also don't have to do that. Unmarked Grave specifically just searches for a non legendary card. It just lines up well. Having a reanimator package just works in Kess because Kess can take advantage of a lot of those same cards. Like if we look at the instant slots, Entomb, just a good card with Kess. We can just set up a whole combo pretty easily. It's a lot of other staple cards. Winds of Rebuke, we want things in our yard messes with top deck tutors so notably we're not on ad nauseum which makes sense we have like a couple five drops more four drops than you'd expect our nauseas probably wouldn't be great 
We are in the one ring instead. Animate Dead and Necromancy counterbalance. We're also a bit slower. We're, we're grinding a bit more. We're trying to set up a turn where it's hard for us to lose. Counterbalance can both be a Grand Abolisher kind of effect and a control tool. Intruder Alarm. It's a little scary sometimes. If you're playing against like a Kennen or a Rog Thras or something like that, it can be maybe don't cast this, but it's also another card that can let our Kiki Jiki go infinite. Of course, we're on Breach. We do have Manamo, School at Water's Edge to go off with our ring. I know this list hasn't been updated. Probably put a Surveil Land in there. It's probably better than like i don't know one of these lands surveil lands are just good if, if there's a deck in here that doesn't have a surveil land in it just assume one of my pieces of advice for the list is put surveil land in there but yeah really cool deck and then the last deck in our first pod is Staxolotl. This is by Listener. You might know them on Twitter for their altars. This uses a commander with a name that I can surely say Zolotl. There's a lot of yak. If I saw this in game, I would probably just call it the big worm. What does our commander do? When it enters or attacks, put a flood counter on target land. That land is an island in addition to its other types for as long as it has a flood counter on it. The main effect, really. At the beginning of your end step, untap each permanent you control with a counter on it. We're going to get to untap a lot of our permanents, get to play on our opponent's turns. We're going to try to take advantage of that, put counters on lots of our things. So we have Oko Thief of Crowns. I think in this sort of deck that's wanting to lock out civic pieces and you're only in blue green anyways, Oko makes a ton of sense. It will mess up board states. It will do really good things in very long games. Teferi is another way for us to play on our opponent's turns. And then Tezzeret lets us look for things. Notably, the one ring gets counters on it. So uh, we get to one ring at least twice a turn. A couple dorks, the lighted halfling, I'm not really sure. We have some artifact synergies, like this is an Urza deck. I'm still not really sure why the Gilded Goose is here over like Birds of Paradise. There's probably some little line here that I don't see. The only time you really see that is like in Dargo decks, but I'm probably just going to assume that, you know, the one that works all the time is going to be better. We have Kinnon and Forensic Gadgeteer as ways of going infinite with Basalt Monolith. Our commander itself is not an outlet. We have outlets, though, in our deck like Urza Lord High Artificer. Forensic Gadgeteer can be one an enabler with Basalt, like I said, because it makes it cost one less to activate, so it goes infinite mana. Also, if you're doing like Holebreaker Horror Loops where you're casting artifact spells, you're going to net infinite mana and make infinite clues, so Forensic Gadgeteer is also an outlet. That card especially works really nicely. Seedborne Muse is kind of what our deck's trying to do anyways. And then Wandering Archaic, Coma. So like you see like a lot of overlap with some of the bigger things that like a Kinnon deck tries to do because we're playing Simic, baby. That's what we're doing. Save for the moment. This is a really fun one. Take an extra turn. Skip the untap step. We don't care. We're untapping our own stuff. We've got flood counters thanks to our worm. That's cool. Three minutes, take an extra turn and untap most of our stuff probably. That's really cool. Some stapley cards. Nature's Claim showing up here. Stubborn Denial. We got a big commander. Six mana though. How often is it on? I don't know. Decisive Denial I really like though because it's blue and a green. Target creature you control. Fight target creature you don't control. That's just good. We're a green deck. If we see a bow masters, we have to punch it. And then counter target non-creature spell unless they pay three. That's basically a counter target spell. Who are we kidding? Remains tricky because it's like really sucks against some cards like Fierce Guardian Show and Deflecting Swat. But it can be really good in other scenarios. Like it can be almost better than a counter spell. And then War of Invention. We have artifacts we're trying to get. We'll get to that. Fast mana. Regular mana. Ozolith, which is going to let us double up on counters. If one or more plus one plus one counters, we put on artifact creature you control. That many plus one plus one plus one counters you gotta love that text and then we can pay one in a green put a counter on an artifact or creature we control it's really cool that we can put it on an artifact but this lets us put counters on pretty much anything on our deck basalt monolith like mana vault that kind of see where i'm going that's really cool winter orb again we're seeing it we untap anyways we don't care about you guys we're gonna get to untap also lines up with urza same with trinisphere the one ring we break parity on the one ring. That's not too hard to do. And then midnight clock, put an hour counter on it. So we have a rock that untaps itself on our end step and then um, time twister with it at some point. Stacks effects like root maze, Ar artifacts and lands come into play tapped. Oh man, if only we could untap those. Stasis. Yeah, same with back to basics and choke. Choke is like only mildly awkward in that you probably want to put the flood counters on forest first. So if you draw it later, your islands are maybe going to be the thing that gets the most speed up on. We're untapping stuff. We, we're going to take advantage of this. Quarter game breaks a cool one. So so we become the monarch, distribute two plus one plus one counters among up to two target creatures. Hey, those are counters. Then if you're the monarch, double the number of those counters. So we get to draw a card. Cool. Two, we get to put counters on stuff. We get done tap stuff. That's cool. We get to beat people to death really quickly because it puts 
two counters on stuff, and then it doubles the counters on each of your creatures, not just the ones it puts, all of the counters. It's scaling super fast. Defense of the heart, we win. But opponent has three or more creatures, we sack it, search for two creatures. You can get Hole Breaker, Horror, and then the Urza or the Forensic Gadgeteer. I mean, that's enough to win on its own. If for some reason that's not gonna line up, you just put down like Coma and Wandering Archaic and just dare people to do anything. And then Frey Elise's wins, this card's awesome in this deck. Whenever a permanent becomes tapped, put a win counter on it. If a permanent with a win counter on it went untapped, during its control is untapped set. Remove all wind counters from it instead. Tap our things, they get counters. We're basically always with this in play going to be able to put counters on our entire board. Super awesome. What an awesome dig uh, you'll find for this kind of deck. We don't really have to go heavy on the basics, even though we're back to basics deck if our commander's in play, but I would like to see it. Probably should go decently heavy on it. I'm not really sure. Nesting Grounds lets us move counters around. Urza Saga, it's a land with a counter. Tendo Ice Bridge, that's a land with a counter. This is a really cool deck. Listeners said they had pretty good results with the, with the deck at, in their events. There's a few things that seem like maybe a little aspirational. I'd probably would like to see more dorks if our game plan is so built around this six mana commander, like getting out to it would be nice. So we, we do have a pretty high amount of artifacts. I'd be curious to see this deck in play, like actually get some games on it myself maybe, and then see how things line up. How often does Tidal Barracuda just make me lose? Just the theory behind it and the looks of the cards and like what's here looks super freaking awesome. Okay, so that was our first pod. So those are your four decks to choose from when you're voting down below. Let me know what you want to move on to the top four. And now we're gonna move on to our second pod, starting with Lanus genetic freak by useless knowledge it has evolved so whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control if that creature has greater power or toughness than this creature put a plus one plus one counter on this creature very easy to get a lot of counters on this thing whenever one or more plus one plus one counters are put on lawness investigate that many times so we'll make a clue whenever this triggers whenever you sacrifice a clue put a plus one plus one counter on another target creature you control just reading it you can kind of think of like well there's probably a way to go infinite with this right yeah there's like a million of them so just here in the little description we have combos include lawness slash extruder and grinding Station, Cryptic Trilobite, Sage of Hours, Walking Ballista, Clan Crafter, and Fathom Mage, maybe more. Who knows? Yeah, this is a deck that I think I was playing with Useless and saw he was seeing synergies of the list like as we were playing it. Extruder is like kind of the simplest one. Sacrifice an artifact, put a plus one plus one counter on target creature. You're going to do that. Sack a clue, put a counter on Lawness. Lawness gets a counter on it. You make a clue, sack a clue. We put a counter. We're going to be getting infinite counters as well as infinite sacrifice and ETBs of artifacts. We can put infinite counters on a walking ballista if we have that in play. We can put them on the cryptic trilobite to make infinite mana. The more things we have in place, so like academy manufacturer, I don't have to explain that. We went over that one. Sage of Hours, we put counters on that. We got to take infinite turns. It's another deck that has a lot of overlapping combos. So we have a whole lot of combos that mainly involve artifacts and creatures, both of which are very easy to tutor for in our colors. Our commander can be a draw engine. It's, at some point, we're going to get to spend two mana to draw a card, if, even if things are moving slowly. Other cards, we've got the other Lawness card, Cryptozoologist. When another non-token creature enters the battlefield, investigate, sacrifice X clues. Opponent reveals top X cards of the library. You put an online permanent with mana value X or less from among them on the battlefield under your control. We got Devoted Druid to potentially go infinite with as well. Negate the counters by putting them from Lawness onto Devoted Druid. Fathom Mage also has Evolve, and whenever a counter is put on it, draw a card. Ones that aren't necessarily things that go infinite but are pretty strong is like Glenelindra. Transmute Artifact works excellently here. Double Major is cool. Copy target creature spell you control, except it isn't legendary if the spell is legendary. Let's clone stuff. We can clone our commander. It's gonna make it way easier to, <laughs> to uh, go infinite. It is gonna be more niche because it is like a two mana clone. You have to use the turn you cast it. Curious how this card is played out. So Agatha Soul Cauldron, you can see where that overlaps. Every new set, there's something that combos with Soul Cauldron. It's gonna be very easy for us to put counters on creatures. Correct Clan Ironworks is gonna be very, you know, we're gonna make clues. We can sack them to make mana. So if we're able to make two clues a time off of a loop, net a clue, sack it, draw a card, the Soul Cleaver. Every time an artifact or creature is put into a graveyard, put a counter on a creature. Clan Crafter, one in a blue, commander creatures you own have two, sack an artifact, put a plus one plus one counter on this creature and draw a card. Basically lets you turn anything into a clue, plus you get the counter. Steel Enchantment's a cool one we see more of. It's an enchant enchantment. Gain control of enchanted enchantment. You gotta love that text. This is a deck that will get better and better frequently. There will be random niche cards that come out that don't look that amazing that help this deck go infinite in more ways. More dedicated people who put the time in on it. I could definitely see this being like a deck that you could expect to see reasonably. This deck just has a lot going for it and you can already kind of see the amount of overlap it has and synergy built in for a very new commander. Then we are looking at Kelly P's 80s kids. What it is, is Will the Wise and Max the Daredevil 
and it's essentially a blood pod deck that's not using Timna Tana and is instead using Will and Max. So what does this change for us? We have two commanders that have relevant text. Timna was the commander of Blood Pod and Tana was there to Neo Format or Eldritch Evolution it. So Will is an infinite mana outlet. If we're able to go infinite, we can get infinite ETBs with Will, cast it infinitely, whatever. We'll make infinite clues and ping down our opponent. So we will either draw our deck or just kill them. It wins the game. And then Max is three mana haste, three, two. Already better than Tana. Uh, when you cast your second spell each turn, untap target creature, then investigate. Maybe not going to be insane on its impact, but you will be able to get some value out of this untapping creatures and a creature focused combo deck. I mean, we're a kiki jiki deck for God's sake, right? There's going to be something there. And then we're getting clues. So there's going to be stuff we're doing here. And again, they're both very cheap. That's very powerful right now. So we've got Karn and Vivian. Vivian's are another way for us to birthing pod. Karn is a way to lock out artifacts. We're on Collector Oof. This can have some tension in the list. If we're doing something like Dockside Emil, it doesn't really work that great with a Collector Oof in play. Draw us our entire deck there. Fiend Artisan, great in this kind of creature toolbox list. Even Mind Sensor. We're going to have lots of tutors. Scavenging Ooze, not one you see too much of, but hey, having that graveyard hate that sits in play can be really nice. We even have Timna in the 98 ready to just be our draw engine. I mean, Blood Pod wanted a Timna. Why wouldn't we want a Temna? Thalia is nice. Creatures and non-basic lands your opponent's control enter the battlefield tapped. There's no Archon of Emeria. There's none of that locking us out from our win con. We also have Mayhem Devil as a way to take over the board and also as another way to go infinite. Ruthless Technomancer. We've talked about Technomancer lines with Dockside. Um, Mayhem Devil is usually a part of those, so that works out here too. We got our Kiki Jiki lines. We can Kiki Jiki, Felidar Guardian. That wins us the game. Yeah, so we're on Birthing Pod and on Vivian. So all we really need is a three drop to pod into Felidar Guardian. Felidar Guardian will flicker our pod effect of choice. We'll pod away Felidar Guardian to get Karmic Guide. Karmic Guide will bring back Felidar Guardian. Do the same thing. Pod that into Kiki Jiki. Copy Karmic Guide. Bring back Felidar Guardian. Flicker Kiki Jiki. Copy Felidar Guardian. We've done the thing. We have won the game. Easy. So we've got the Angel's Grace. The main thing that sticks out here is Baleful Mastery, which is three and a black. You can pay one and a black instead. If you do, an opponent draws a card, exile target creature or planeswalker. Two mana away to get rid of anything. It's gone permanently, which is pretty nice. The exile is pretty big in our reanimate loop and dock side nonsense shenanigans format. The other cool thing about this card is you can exile one person's thing like somebody's trying to win with whatever some kind of creature combo exile their thing and then you can let somebody else draw a card who might be you know more than control player at the table aether vial been seeing more of this in these kind of decks super smart really great makes your creatures like uncounterable kind of goes crazy cloudstone cure another way for us to go infinite with dockside and then our birthing pot of course deafening silence this is the one rule of law effect we have it barely affects us at all so i think i'm not sure a lot of the blood pod decks have been on historically i almost wonder if we even really want the oof i guess having the oof is nice but like there's just gonna be some games where we're just like man i hate this guy we are not a gaius cradle deck that's kind of surprising seeing as we're on 37 creatures i'm curious about logic on that because it just seems like it would be kind of a slam dunk here this i think this is a really cool list i really like the idea of swapping to these commanders for this style of deck over this looks great to me next up in pod number two we've got Cobblepot's barracuda so this is an animar deck this has been a list that Cobblepot has been putting a lot of thought into. There's a primer here you can look at, which isn't completed yet, but it goes over some of the main philosophy of the list and uh, some of the combos that you have access to, although it doesn't go into details on those yet. Cobblepot also did a pretty long write-up about this list when he, they had submitted it to this competition or whatever you want to call this video. We'll kind of just read this here, right? The idea is that the CDH counter spell suite is very good at interacting with itself, non creatures spells struggles to interact with creatures and creature oriented disruption we'll kind of get into that what he means there grand abolisher and friends are very effective at hosing the established cdh counter suite either someone has a channel land or it's gg animar cost reduction having animar online generally means the colorless part of creature cost is zero thus colorless creatures are often free to cast creatures with morph megamorph disguise are colorless when cast face down thus often free we got to see this with the kadena list that we covered get to use liberator or his battle thopter or skittering cicada as ways to cast their colors that spells as though they have flash and then and most of our non-colorless spells have flash anyways, like Holebreaker Horror, Spell Splutter Strike, Endurance. Interactive creature abilities are triggered or activated and don't care about summoning sickness. This is really important with the Grand Abolisher thing, right? They cast Grand Abolisher, they go to do a thing. I can still flip my morphs, doesn't matter. So loops, there's a lot of overlapping Animar combos. We're not gonna go into all of them. The main ones involve Ancestral Statue, Holebreaker Horror, 
Baron Master Wizard. These two are probably the ones you're most familiar with. And then Ashaya. So we have Walking Ballista. This is a deck that can make infinite mana up a billion different ways. Walking Ballista is a great outlet for it. We're going to have a combination of good teamer creatures. You'll see some that are going to stand out as more familiar than others. You know, the Holebreaker Horror, Constance, that's a good one. Glenelandra, Kitesail Arsonist, another card we've been seeing a lot more of. We also have Ashaya, which is not a card you see a lot of outside of Mono Green, honestly, or like Gruul. This can go off with Korean Ranger, probably what it's most known for. He's even running like the Lotus Cobra and Nissa, which can Nissa can help assemble that Ashaya combo, which is cool. Other cards that stand out, Hope of Gearper. It's a way to silence an opponent. Siren Storm Tamer, Activated Interaction, Anox Survivalist. You're going to see some of the morphs that we saw in the last week's video. Then Protector, an Eternal Witness effect on a morph. Kadena Silencer, counters all abilities. I love this kind of stuff. Spell Stutter Sprite is a creature counter spell. Awesome. Reality Chip is a cool one. So if we get infinite mana, this is going to let us cast our entire deck. Heartward Storyteller is one of the ones he talked about there. Whenever a player casts a non-creature spell, each of that player's opponents may draw a card. We're not going to do an awful lot of that. I talked about this, I think when I went over Yeva recently. There is merit to all of our opponents having lots of ways to interact with each other that keeps them from being able to win while we assemble. And then because our deck is very hard to interact with with the normal interaction suite, we're not triggering this and drawing them cards while we win. And then we also, you know, there's only a few cards they're going to be able to use to actually interact with us. So instead statue when it enters the battlefield return a line land permanent you control to its owner's hand this thing will be free a lot of times so it and then like you know a free mana rock can go infinite a dock side can be mana positive there's lots of different ways to just once you've reduced all your stuff with animar's ability all your creatures you know cost four less or something uh it's very very easy to go infinite no eldritch evolution weird harvest x green green each player may search his or her library for up to x creature cards reveal those cards put them into their hand that's pretty cool we're gonna take advantage of that pretty well if we make a lot of mana we even need a lot of mana we just have two card creature combos a lot of our opponents will have creatures that they want but if we've set up animar we're going to be able to tutor for things that cost like a total of one mana or something right we do ancestral statue and dockside extortionist you know our hole breaker horror might be blue blue signal the clans search your library for three creature cards reveal them if you reveal three creatures with different names choose one of them at random put that card in your hand shelf the rest in your library we can search for redundant effects then a pretty slim interaction package in terms of the instance because we're doing it manually with our creatures stuff you'd expect here and then compost is cool whenever a black card is put into one of your opponent's graveyards you may draw a card that's going to happen throughout a game i'm really curious how this card has been testing this was like a card that was way more popular back in the day like when i was looking at old deck lists this would show up just a draw engine you had access to if black's really popular and then 28 lands we're doing the cradle you can go look at that write up on the twitter thread cobblepot posted to get more details just like highlighting this kind of deck building that i think there's a lot of good stuff here our last deck for pod number two is Godzilla Biggs, the Anglo Zanzibar War, a turbo style Just Guy the War Doctor deck named after the fastest war in recorded history, which lasted about 38 minutes. I've talked briefly about the War Doctor. I don't think I've covered it. I played against uh, this player when they were running it with, I think it was Boros. My first thought, I looked at the companions and I was like, man, you should put this with K9. It's like, this is like, you almost get a Roger. It's like, you know, it costs one mana, but it has text. One mana, one, one. As long as it's untapped, other legendary creatures you control have word one. One in a blue target legendary creature can't be blocked this turn. That's not throwaway attack. The War Doctor. Two red, white. Whenever one or more other permanents phase out and whenever one or more cards are put into exile from anywhere, put a time counter on the War Doctor. Whenever the War Doctor attacks, it deals damage equal to the number of time counters on any target. Creature dealt damage this way would die this turn, exile instead. So cards that might trigger this are like Swords to Plowshares, Path to Exile, Demonic Consultation, Tainted Pact, March of Swirling Mist, Flicker Effects. Like there's a lot of things that trigger this that just happen in CDH play on top of this deck is being built to do this a lot. It's going to be very easy in practice to get this thing to like three-ish counters. Like that's not asking a lot. Just at three, it's going to attack for three, shoot something for three. That can be a player. That's going to matter when the when the number gets bigger. And then it feeds itself because when it kills a creature, that creature gets exiled and then you get a time counter. So it makes it really hard to keep a board of creatures in play. Any kind of creature focused deck, there's just removal on a stick here that's going to exile your things, which is really relevant for a lot of like the green creature combo decks. And when it gets big and it gets fed a lot then it just starts going face hit you know dome you for 10 we have things like dockside baron loop okay containment priest that's pretty cool because then we can set it up to where if other people's stuff gets flickered or whatever we can keep it from happening though it's also going to stop our own stuff so we gotta watch out for that thos's oracle here dual caster mage delny doesn't really work with either of our commanders but it will work with things like our 
Dockside, our Ragavan, Esper Sentinel, stuff like that. Professional Facebreaker. We're going to be getting into combat a lot. We're going to exile cards with this. So we're going to trigger this. Expressive Iteration. That's going to exile a card. Jessica's Will. That exiles cards and it's good. We've got the Savine's Wreck to go with our Breach Package. Infernal Blunge taking advantage of our one mana commander. Some typical interaction stuff you would expect, but then also things like March of the Worldly Light, which doesn't always show up. Exiles a thing, triggers our commander. Uh, no Ephemerate, none of that stuff. I'm a little surprised because we are a Jeskai list that takes advantage of exiling our own stuff. And we have Spill Seeker and Final Fortune in here. So it seems pretty close to free to just run Ephemerate, have that combo line available to us. 20 artifacts, Paradise Mantle, Springleaf Drum, taking advantage of our cheap commander, Grinding Station, so doing that along with our Breach. All the Talismans we can run, basically. That's kind of crazy. <laughs> Trouble in Pairs, this is one we've talked about. Draw Engine, draw us a lot of cards. I have talked about this one, but that was in the Ambassador Loquatus video. Human of Upkeep, exile the top card of your library. When a player doesn't pay its Human of Upkeep, that player exiles all cards from their library. And then at any point, you can exile the top card of your library to print the next one down we don't do this term. At any point, you can exile your whole library. You can win with Thassa's Oracle that way. That works nicely. Or you can just bonk. Hit somebody for 40. 23 lands. Wow. I mean, I know we're trying to, we're, we're kind of rock signing it out, but we could maybe cut a talisman or two, run another land. We don't, you know, like they're free, right? <laughs> just my advice. <laughs> Uh, maybe maybe it lines up better this way. I don't know. Really cool list. The War Doctor is a very powerful commander. You get it into play. You'll if you see it in play, you'll understand it. Curious to see how this will get like ironed out and shaped up in the future if more people play this commander. Really good stuff. This is the conclusion to part one of, I guess, this series. Next time, we're going to be taking a look at pods three and four for our top 16. Make sure you go down into the comments below and vote for your favorite deck in pod number one. That is these four decks and your favorite deck for pod number two out of these four decks. We're gonna tally up those votes and those two decks that win will go into the top four when we get to that. If you enjoyed this, please let me know down below. Let me know if you think this is cool, if you wanted to see more stuff like this. As always, thank you so much for watching and go play CDH. Have a good one, everybody.